the president's picks. Reaction and analysis after President Donald Trump releases his list of candidates he would consider for the Supreme Court if re-elected. Large fire. More bad news for the people of Beirut. Fight for religious freedom. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo receives a suggestion from a bipartisan group of senators. And no laughing matter. We hear about a new movie that appears to make light of a young woman's abortion. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump challenges Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden to release his list of potential Supreme Court picks. The president says it is important for voters to weigh the information before the election. For his part, President Trump vowed yesterday to nominate conservatives who would uphold the Constitution. Over the next four years, America's president will choose hundreds of federal judges and in all likelihood, one, two, three, and even four Supreme Court justices. President Donald Trump says nominating a Supreme Court justice is one of the most important decisions a president can make. He announced 20 names yesterday that he would add to his list of potential picks. Every one of these individuals will ensure equal justice, equal treatment, and equal rights for citizens of every race, color, religion, and creed. Senator Ted Cruz writes, it's humbling and an immense honor to be considered for the Supreme Court. He's one of three senators included on the new list. We're not going to get any better than Justice Scalia. The best we can do is preserve constitutional victories like upholding the Second Amendment, like protecting religious liberty. Also named Senator Tom Cotton, who quickly made headlines for tweeting, it's time for Roe v. Wade to go. And Senator Josh Hawley, who says that he would rather stay in the Senate to help the president by, quote, confirming constitutional conservatives. Ted and Josh and Tom are, uh, uh, they're whip smart. Um, uh, they, are, they, are, they understand the role of a judge. They understand that judges aren't supposed to be politicians in robes. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden will only say that he would pick a black woman. Joe Biden has refused to release his list, perhaps because he knows the names are so extremely far left that they could never withstand public scrutiny. And the Democrat supports those who support abortion. Joe Biden doesn't want to acknowledge who he would put on the Supreme Court. And I think that should, that should give us pause. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about President Trump's list of potential Supreme Court nominees is John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. John, welcome back. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I know that you know this process well. Back in 2016, you compiled a list of potential Supreme Court nominees to, su to secede, that is, Justice Scalia, and nearly all of your recommendations ended up making the White House list of nominees. What's your initial impressions of those listed to fill a p potential vacancy on the high court, and what are some of the characteristics that they share? Sure. Well, I was I was very pleased by the list and impressed by it, and and delighted to see that the last name on my original list that he had not included got added, uh, and so actually five names, uh, several of four of whom I recently recommended made it onto the president's uh, list, and I think that these are are excellent people. I don't know all of them. I'm, you know, I, I watched that blockbuster speech by Daniel Cameron, the Kentucky Attorney General. There's a Third Circuit judge, uh, Peter Phipps, uh, whom I'm not familiar with. But I'm going to start studying their records. Uh, I was surprised that three senators were put on the list. So the president had previously only put on the list uh, sitting judges, with the exception of Senator Mike Lee. He's obviously now added not only Paul Clement, who was on my original list, but Noel Francisco, Daniel Cameron, the three senators uh, whom you mentioned. So he's broadened the aperture of the types of candidates that he is on this list uh, are a bit better known by social conservatives uh, and not so much focused on things like uh, expressing a concern or criticism of uh, the power of executive branch agencies. So there was a bit of a nod towards social conservatives. Uh, but these are some very, very well-qualified men and women. 
You mentioned uh, Paul Clement, one of your original choices. Let's talk about him a, a little bit more. And uh, he has been added to the president's updated list, as you mentioned. What makes him a strong candidate? Well, he's he's the preeminent uh, Supreme Court litigator uh, in the country. Paul has argued over a hundred cases before the high court and and dozens, if not hundreds, before the lower uh, federal courts of appeals on a whole slew of issues. Anybody who's ever watched him uh, in court knows that he is a brilliant advocate with a keen mind. Uh, he's also a superb writer. I mean, his, his briefs are a pleasure to read. And I have no doubt that if he was an associate justice, that he would bring that keen mind and that rather sparkling uh, writing quality to bear. I, I, he would be an outstanding justice. Uh, I, you know, he's just getting added now. Uh, but I would note that Justice Gorsuch uh, was not on the original list by President Trump. He made it to the second iteration. Brett Kavanaugh made it to the third iteration. And now they are both uh, justices uh, on the Supreme Court. So the same thing could happen to Paul Clement. And I, for one, would be very pleased by that. Were there any picks that surprised you? Yeah, I was surprised to see uh, three senators uh, on there. Not that there's anything uh, wrong with them. So Josh Hawley, who granted, has said he's not interested. A uh, clerk for Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, Senator Cruz, clerk for Chief Justice William uh, Rehnquist. Tom Cotton didn't clerk for Supreme Court Justice, but he clerked for Judge Jerry Smith on the Fifth Circuit. Uh, these are three very smart individuals who clearly know a lot about and care a lot about uh, the Constitution. Uh, Daniel Cameron, certainly very, very young, uh, but shows a lot of promise. After he gave his speech, I remember turning to some friends next to me who watched it and said, well, there's a guy who's got a future. Uh, well, part of that future now involves being on the Supreme Court list. But, you know, he's very young. He's 34. Uh, Allison Rushing, who is whip smart on the Fourth Circuit. I, I, she wasn't on my list, but I was delighted to see her name uh, is only 38. But, but she clerked for a number of great uh, judges, including Justice Thomas. Uh, and if, they are, if their time hasn't come now, I certainly hope that perhaps their time will come at some point in the future, perhaps during a second Trump term. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time and your insight. John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks again. Good to be with you. Our Senate Democrats voted today to reject the GOP's scaled-back COVID-19 relief bill. It is so emaciated, so filled with poison pills, so partisanly designed, it was designed to fail. Democratic leader Chuck Schumer called the $500 billion bill Republican intimidation. He wants the bill's failure to inspire Republicans to return to the negotiating table with more money. Senate Republicans say the bill was a fiscally responsible option to give help to individuals and small businesses. A month after the devastating explosion in Beirut, Beirut a huge fire is now burning at the port. A column of thick black smoke billowed from the port with orange flames leaping into the air as firefighters tried to put out the fire. The Army says it started in a warehouse storing oil and tires. Just over a month ago, a massive explosion killed some 190 people and left a quarter million homeless. China says the U.S. move to revoke student visas for 1,000 Chinese students is, quote, outright political persecution and racial discrimination. A spokesman for China's foreign ministry says it damages the legitimate rights of Chinese students. Yesterday, acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf announced that DHS is blocking visas for certain Chinese graduate students with ties to China's military. The number of COVID-19 cases in the Japanese capital is dropping, and the governor of Tokyo is now letting restaurants stay open after 10 p.m. Japan never went into total lockdown, but instead asked bars and karaoke parlors to close early. The government of Myanmar locks down parts of its biggest city as infections rise. Myanmar, also known as Burma, is also suspending campaigning for elections in November and issuing stay-at-home orders for most of the city of Rangoon. That means people can only go outside for necessary activities.
Fire struck for the second time in Greece's overcrowded refugee camp on the island of Lesbos. Last night's blaze forced about 4,000 migrants to evacuate. The camp is home to more than 10,000 people. Coronavirus restrictions have angered many refugees and religious leaders have appealed for help from neighboring countries. Joining us now is Cardinal Jean-Claude Olerich, Archbishop of Luxembourg and President of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union. Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you met with Pope Francis today. What was his message to you, and was migration a topic of discussion? Uh, yes, so it was a great pleasure to meet the Pope. He's in good shape. <laughs> and uh, we were discussing, of course, about the commission of the bishops of the European Union, the dialogue, the ongoing dialogue we have with the institutions of the European Union. And we were discussing also the sad uh, uh, situation at the refugee camp on the island of Lesbos, the camp of Moria, which is uh, in fire, on fire. And uh, it's good to see the pope who cares for people. Uh, he, who, he cares for everybody, but especially for the poor, the sick, the abandoned. And uh, that's great. And you feel that he's very close to Christ. You know? And he tries, he's radical in his interpretation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So some people say the Pope is liberal. I think he's radical. You know? I know uh, in a recent interview you said the church in Europe will be weaker due to the coronavirus pandemic. Why is that? And what do you think needs to be done yeah. to help rebuild the church in Europe? Uh, the church in Europe is very weak. And it's weaker in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe. But you see the same signs also in Eastern Europe, very strong secularization. I myself have been a missionary for 23 years in Japan. So when I came back to Europe nine years ago, first I did not recognize the church anymore because the church, which was very strong in Luxembourg, uh, had become very weak. It had become a church of old people, without children, without young people. And the pandemia, I think, will accelerate this process of, uh, because we have still a lot of cultural Christians, of left and of right, who come to church, but where there is no real faith anymore, where there is no relation with Jesus Christ. And I think they will stop coming back. And then we can seize the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and to bring back Christ to the life, uh, lives of people. And at the same time, we have to care for the new poverty uh, emerging uh, from this pandemia. And I think that this proclamation of faith together with the help for the weakest will be a very strong act of evangelization. Well, Your Eminence, thank you so much for your time today. We really do appreciate it. Cardinal Jean-Claude Olerich, President of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Coming up, a group of senators write to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo regarding attempts to strengthen religious freedom. A tabernacle stolen from a cathedral in Ontario, Canada on Tuesday was found by parishioners yesterday. The tabernacle was discovered in a canal. Local media reports the Eucharist was not found in the tabernacle, but because it was located in a body of water, it may have dissolved. A host that is dissolved ceases to be a consecrated host. Two nuns seized in Mozambique by rebels affiliated with ISIS have been released. They were held for over three weeks. Their order, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Chambury, says the nuns were freed on Sunday and are now getting medical checks. Fourteen senators are calling on Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to add more countries to the State Department's watch list for their violations of religious freedom. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? 
Well, Tracy, the bipartisan group of senators say that it's vital for the U.S. to protect the rights of people and be able to practice whatever faith that they want to. And they are highlighting a report, an international religious freedom report, in order to bring to light the atrocities that are taking place around the world. We see religious persecution everywhere. Senator Tom Tillis was instrumental in helping secure the release of Pastor Andrew Brunson, who was imprisoned in Turkey in 2016 when a coup attempt against the Turkish president failed. Take a look at what President Erdogan and the Turkish government did to Pastor Brunson, who I personally worked on to get released from prison after two years. You can go even in even in what you would consider to be democratic countries, you see religious persecution all over the world, and we have to make people aware of it. Senator Tillis and 13 other senators have signed a letter to highlight the, quote, abuse, persecution, and discrimination experienced by people in groups of faith around the world. They are pushing for the State Department to add to their list of countries a particular concern, where egregious violations of religious freedom are allowed to happen increasing the list from nine countries to 14, and adding India, Nigeria, Russia, Syria, and Vietnam. And they want 11 more countries added to the special watch list, a group of places where religious freedom violations are tolerated for a total of 15 nations, including Turkey, where Pastor Brunson was held. Democratic Senator Chris Coons is co-chair of the Human Rights Caucus. Today, he tells me it's important to defend religious liberty worldwide. Religious liberty, religious freedom is a fundamental human right. Whenever we can advance um, liberty in all its forms, we should, and religious liberty is a key part of that. The chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom tells EWTN that she welcomes the letter by senators and she's urging the State Department to take meaningful action, real action against these countries to bring change. Bottom line, to hold them accountable. Tracy. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, host Catherine Hadro talks to the president of Focus on the Family. I think it's, it's good news that the country is waking up. The pro-life movement is gaining momentum. More and more people are not uh, comfortable with the issue of abortion. Last year, the group showed a live 4D ultrasound in Times Square. We'll hear what the group is planning for their virtual gathering later this month. That's tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. Eastern. Up next... Analysis of a controversial movie and its comedic treatment of abortion. A new movie is getting both attention and backlash for its comedic treatment of abortion. Unpregnant, now streaming on HBO Max and adapted from the young adult novel by the same name, tells the story of a teenage girl's thousand-mile road trip with her former best friend to obtain an abortion without parental permission. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about Unpregnant is Father Dave Pavanka, president of the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and Maureen Ferguson, senior fellow of the Catholic Association and co-host of EWTN's radio show and podcast, Conversations with Consequences. Welcome back, and thank you both for being on the show. I know the two of you recently co-authored an opinion piece on this movie and its trivialization of abortion. What did you think when you saw the trailer, and what was your first reaction? Father Dave, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Well, thank you for letting us be here with you. Uh, honestly, my first reaction was was actually total sadness. When I heard about this, and when I saw the trailer, and when I saw the video of the, the man and woman who made this, honestly, it was just this really sadness, like I've been hit in the gut. And the, honestly, the first thing I did is I went to the chapel and, and I just prayed. It's just, it's just so dark and it's so twisted and the corruption of that, which is, it just, it, so the first thing I did is, is I was sad and I went and prayed. And, and that's what, honestly what I continue to feel for this whole situation is just what we've done to undermine the value and the beauty and the dignity of life and, and that we can make a comedy out of abortion. It's just, it was just unbelievable. Yeah, Maureen, your thoughts. Well, Father, da uh, Father Dave flagged this for me. I was unaware of it. And 
as a mother, I'm usually pretty tuned in to what's being marketed to our teenagers. Um, we all know that pop culture has become so toxic, but I think this one really reaches some new lows. And I was so grateful that Father Dave flagged this and asked if I would be interested in co-writing this piece with him. We're grateful USA Today published it. Um, but my reaction was really just the same. I was profoundly sad. It's an incredibly insensitive movie being marketed to our teenagers, giving them the message that abortion is no big deal and you can even just laugh about it. And and if any of your viewers aren't familiar with the, the backstory, it's these girls who, well, one girl finds herself pregnant and she lives in a state where there are parental consent laws. So she and a friend go on a road trip to another state. So they're also teaching our teenagers how to circumvent state laws. Um, but and then it's this movie that's supposed to be hilarious. Um, and of course, comedy, you know, humor can be an excellent tool in many situations to add a little levity to situations. But of course, abortion is 100 percent tragic. It's tragic for the unborn child, of course, but such a sadness for the mother as well. Maureen, uh, this was going to actually go into my next question, talking to you as a mother. Uh, this movie is rated PG-13, and of course you're concerned about the overall message this movie sends, as all parents are and all people. What message do you think it sends that's considered acceptable viewing for children that young? Well, I'm a mother of five children, and when I talked to some of my teenage girls about this, they were horrified. They said, first of all, a girl who finds herself in that situation is going to be terrified. And what she needs is a message of hope and a message of encouragement that you can do this. She needs to be showered with love uh, and hope. And so my daughter's reaction was, oh, my gosh, this is just a horribly insensitive way to handle a really difficult issue. And as a mother, of course, um, I mean, to say this is OK for a 13-year-old to view is just, I mean, as I said, we know Hollywood uh, does not share our values, but this is a very aggressive push to undermine the sanctity of life and the parent-child relationship because they're teaching girls to go around their parents around the state law, which requires parental notification or consent. And um, I mean, it, it's, it, it's outrageous on many levels. Yeah, uh, we don't have much time left, but I do want to talk about this again. Uh, you both mentioned in your piece that one of the movie's screenwriters and co-author of the book talked about the use of laughter as a way of, quote, taking away fear and shame. What's your response to that? And we all know the sanctity of life is so precious, and it's a serious topic. Father Dave, your comment. Well, yeah, on one level, I agree that there's, I, I, I'd love to laugh. And I think there's a real sense of, of holy laughter that's good and that's virtuous and that's right. But I found myself reflecting on the text from the beginning of the 12th chapter of Romans, where Paul says that we need our mind to be transformed so that we can know what is good. And this is just a prime example of, of our culture saying something is good, but it's their mind has been so warped and so twisted that they could actually say that it's a good thing to laugh about the topic of abortion, that it's a good thing to laugh. And, and again, it just it shows, I think, the depravity that we've come to. And and just really quickly, that, that I think is important as well is that I'm sure the author of this has friends who had abortion, but it just seems so insensitive to the to the woman. And and I've tragically had to walk with women before who have had to deal with this. And it's there's nothing funny about it. Even in the most egregious situation, there's nothing funny about it. And, and I just wondered what was motivating everything when it was all said and done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both for coming on and talking about this and, and bringing this to light. We appreciate it. Father Dave Pavanka, president of the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and Maureen Ferguson, senior fellow of the Catholic Association and co-host of EWTN's radio show, and podcast conversations with consequences. Thank you both again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.